Well, Tena Koto Katoa, good morning everybody and welcome to Victoria University uh, here in Wellington. Um, delighted you were able to, to join us uh, today and we've got a number of other people joining us virtually uh, as this presentation is, is being live streamed. So today we're going to talk about uh, the outcomes from the UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP23 that was just held in, in Bonn and next steps. Uh, we spoke in this very room just before we left for Bonn uh, so it's a good chance to compare what we expected uh, with what actually happened, both in terms of the negotiations and the uh, climate, the global climate action agenda. Um, also this time wanted to bring in uh, some other perspectives. So um, in addition to some of us who were on the official delegation, we've, we've got uh, a couple of other people we are very pleased to have agreed to join us here today. So just to introduce you quickly to who's on the panel, um, and to begin with, I'm Jo Tyndall, the Climate Change Ambassador uh, for New Zealand. To my left is Anna Broadhurst, who headed the delegation uh, at the COP in Bonn. Um, next to her is Seamus Dunn, um, who uh, is uh, at Foreign Affairs and Trade and was a member of the New Zealand delegation. Um, to his left is Craig McKenzie, who heads up the Precision Agriculture Association of New Zealand um, and participated in a side event uh, we'll talk about uh, over the course of this di uh, discussion. Then uh, we have Rachel Cooper, who uh, is representing Aotearoa Youth Leadership Institute, um, who was uh, um, a member of the, the youth delegation um, in uh, um, Bonn. And finally, to her left, Victoria Hatton, who uh, is with the Ministry for Primary Industries and will talk about uh, some of the agriculture work that uh, was done at the COP. So um, we are going to give a quick run through on our various impressions of the COP uh, and then leave time for some Q&A at the end. So to kick off, just uh, wanted to recall what we'd said before we left for Bonn. And it was, uh, um, you may recall, an interesting time. It was the very day, I think, that uh, ministers with the, the new government were being sworn in. So definitely very, very early days in the, in the new administration. At that time, we said that um, COP23 was not uh, about making major uh, definitive decisions in the climate change uh, agenda. Nonetheless, an extremely important meeting uh, uh, for several reasons. So first, uh, as indicated there, it was important for the Paris Agreement Work Program, the rather ugly acronym PORP, uh, to uh, demonstrate it, it was making advances so that it could definitely be seen to be on track uh, for meeting the, the deadline to conclude its work uh, in 2018. Secondly, uh, the facilitative dialogue for, for 2018 uh, needed to be, um, the design needed to be confirmed. Uh, and it was clear that this design was not to be negotiated, but was in the hands of the two COP presidencies, um, uh, Morocco and Fiji, to, uh, to sort out in consultation with parties. Then uh, the Paris mandated work uh, to be con completed uh, at, the, at COP23 included finalising agenda action plan, and confirming the role of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. So those were definitely the, uh, you know, the, the slated decision making um, uh, or, or focuses for work of, of the COP. In addition, uh, it was very clear that uh, a, a priority for the COP would be to demonstrate continuing political momentum, especially since this was the first conference since the United States President um, had announced uh, the US intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement earlier this year. Um, and I think uh, that, uh, uh, as others will probably note, um, 
that political momentum was very, very strongly uh, um, reinforced um, with uh, uh, a strong, strong United States presence, not so much on the official delegation, uh, but in the sense of state level, city level, and business level um, uh, representation with America's pledge. Um, and also the fact that uh, the conference organisers expected some 20,000 people to register all up for um, participation in COP23, and in the end some 27,000 delegates were registered. So it was, uh, it was pretty massive. Um, finally, uh, in terms of importance, this was Fiji's COP, despite it, of course, being held in wintry Bonn. Um, and uh, we were reminded of uh, the Pacific flavour, the perspective uh, of the Pacific in numerous ways throughout the COP. Um, the uh, Fiji Prime Minister, Baini Marama, um, said frequently uh, that we were all in the same waka, um, and that I think was symbolised um, quite directly with the uh, erection of this drua. Um, with its sale in the main uh, foyer of the conference centre in Bonn. Uh, a lot of photographs were taken in front of the, uh, the Drua there. Um, pictured in there are the uh, presiding officers of the, the main bodies, um, the uh, two subsidiary bodies under the, the UNFCCC, the SBI and the Substa. Um, that's the two blokes on the outside. And then uh, myself and, and uh, my Saudi Arabian colleague, Sarah Bayashan, uh, who are uh, co-chairing the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Paris Agreement, the APA. Um, and you'll be interested to note that uh, the uh, person on the right, Tomasz Khrushchev, um, from uh, Poland, will have a significant role next year, right at the end of the conference. It was announced that not only would he be Poland's high-level climate champion uh, for the next year, but also uh, he would be Poland's lead uh, negotiator, taking over the role that Ambassador, in due course, uh, the role that Ambassador Naz Khan from Fiji had um, this, for this COP. Um, so uh, the, the significance, I guess, of the four presiding officers being together was um, a demonstration uh, of the amount of time we were spending coordinating with each other to ensure that the multiple interconnections and linkages between different elements of the Paris Agreement work program were understood um, and that uh, we were troubleshooting, if you like, and, and making sure we were uh, operating in a consistent and coherent way. So that was what we'd talked about beforehand, um, did the COP deliver? And uh, I think as you'll see from uh, this slide, um, yes, indeed, it did. Uh, so the Paris Agreement Work Programme made progress across the board. Um, and uh, there, uh, I guess, during the course of the, the COP, my role was exclusively as a co-chair of the uh, APA. So I um, uh, was definitely feeling the heat, if you like, and the responsibility for demonstrating uh, a good degree of, of progress on the Paris Agreement work program. Um, the output was not a negotiating text, um, not, not a draft text, and it was never expected uh, that we'd get to the, that point uh, at the COP itself. Instead, um, we had a series of so-called informal notes by co-facilitators for each of the main items on the Paris Agreement Work Programme agenda. Um, and the importance of those notes were um, that they uh, endeavoured to set out the broad structure uh, that would inform the outcome uh, for the implementation guidelines to be uh, adopted and agreed next year. Uh, and the content uh, of those guidelines. Content in the form of bullet points or narrative, um, but at this stage, with all options still on the table. Um, it's not the time yet, um, I think, to take things off the table. 
So uh, you get that overall sense of scope and content. However, we do have a long way to go, go on one item, um, that is in relation to uh, the mitigation aspects of nationally determined contributions. Um, that's a, a hugely sensitive political um, uh, issue. Uh, and uh, I think there are, there are safe to say there are extremely strongly held views on what the scope of NDCs is or should be, mitigation only, or going beyond mitigation to include adaptation um, and or indeed climate finance. Uh, and uh, sensitivities and strongly held views over the question of differentiation, whether in terms of accounting approaches um, or information to be provided uh, to aid with the understanding and, and clarity um, of NDCs should be different for developed or de and developing countries or the same, but different only uh, in terms of the, uh, um, the type of uh, target that uh, countries might have taken. Now, because those sensitivities are running rife, um, and at this COP, we didn't really get um, ministerial uh, engagement or involvement to broker solutions, uh, in the mitigation area, it proved impossible to really agree um, on a structure that would um, accommodate those widely divergent views. So we ended up with um, uh, an informal note that um, became a bit of a dumping ground for everybody's um, option, reflected in full, and it ran to 181 um, pages. So there's uh, a good deal of work that needs uh, to be done there, um, including, a, a, if you find it, I don't, I'm not sure which page it's on, Steve, but um, apparently somewhere in there, because I haven't found it yet, um, Switzerland has included um, its accounting guidelines for um, it in relation to chocolate. Um, I think giving their commentary on uh, how they felt about the process that was unfolding in the mitigation um, uh, discussion. So uh, the next thing was the, uh, the facilitative dialogue. Uh, 2018, and uh, the design was indeed um, uh, concluded, was welcomed uh, in the COP decision and uh, annexed to that, that COP decision. Um, there was some debate as to whether it would be adopted, decided, welcomed, um, or whatever. In the end, it was welcomed, um, and that's uh, definitely all we need. Fiji also got near acceptance of a name change, um, so the facilitative dialogue um, is to be known as the Talanoa Dialogue. Um, they would have got full acceptance of that, except for some reservations on the part of one or two countries um, about the Talanoa concept, which is uh, a methodology for decision making. Um, and those countries were um, particularly sensitive about the view that, uh, that, that, the, tallow, that the facilitative dialogue was not um, a decision-making process. It's to inform everybody as they go back home to do their domestic decision-making about their, their um, NDCs for the future. Um, so uh, the boxes were um, very importantly uh, ticked on both the gender action plan and the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. Uh, a lot of hard work um, and uh, do acknowledge that uh, um, we had two people, Paula on the gender action plan and Amelia um, working on the IPP uh, that both contributed significantly to the, uh, the good outcome. Um, the activities under the Global Climate Action Agenda were extensive and impressive, and uh, New Zealand's role on that is going to be touched on later. And that was where the US presence was very, very strongly uh, evident. Um, getting a Talanoa recognised was important uh, to Fiji, um, and uh, they very much emphasised um, uh, the spirit of Talanoa, the, the storytelling, the inclusivity, um, etc. as important themes. And this photograph demonstrates uh, the very visual way uh, and symbolic way 
uh, in which the Pacific flavor and the Buller spirit was injected. Here, uh, this was uh, um, a carver ceremony uh, as part of the uh, opening plenary of the, uh, the COP. So, the COP delivered on the identified objectives, but of course some outcomes were not anticipated, um, and uh, a bit of it was, uh, some of it was good, some of it was not so good. Um, there's no such thing, I suppose, as a COP without drama, and my secretariat colleagues, many of whom have been there for um, probably uh, nearly two decades, they confirmed they could not recall a single COP that had finished um, by the scheduled time of 6 p.m. Friday of the second week. Um, and this one in Bonn was no exception, so we had a through the night um, marathon on Friday in order to get there in time for breakfast on, on Saturday morning. The unexpected sticking points were um, in a, a couple of areas. Um, climate finance, uh, um, uh, two issues there. It's always, of course, a priority for developing countries, um, climate finance. Um, and uh, that's uh, I think reflected in the sheer number of um, agenda items. It became hugely difficult, uh, a logistical nightmare to try and schedule meetings that didn't involve parallel sessions on finance where um, people would turn up for um, a meeting and say, well, our lead negotiator on finance is not here um, for the, the G77, so we can't have the meeting. Um, and it became uh, almost a crisis to, to try and manage that. But in both cases, uh, there were specific finance issues. Um, and I, I guess the debate or the argument um, revolved around um, uh, one group of parties feeling that uh, another group was reneging on a deal uh, that had been made uh, at an earlier point and trying to renegotiate something that had been put to bed. Um, and on the other side, um, a, a very strongly held view on the part of uh, developing countries that um, regardless, decisions on these issues were needed now um, and uh, that um, work needed to be done in order to give certainty and predictability about the future of climate finance. So very briefly on those two issues, first of all was one in relation to the Adaptation Fund, um, a creature of the Kyoto Protocol that has worked uh, on the basis in the past um, of receiving a share of proceeds uh, from uh, the um, uh, exchange of, of units, if you like, under the uh, Clean Development Mechanism. Um, with the uh, expectation that um, this adaptation fund will at some point move to serve the Paris Agreement uh, away from the Kyoto Protocol and, and towards the Paris Agreement. So um, for the adaptation fund there are trickier legal, technical and governance issues than for some, uh, the other um, multilateral funds like the Green Climate Fund or the, the Global Environment Facility. Um, because of that, that uh, um, funding basis and its relationship to the, the Kyoto Protocol. It is expected to happen that it will serve the Paris Agreement, but the sequencing of de decision making was being debated. At the COP, we eventually inched forward with uh, a CMP decision, so the CMP is the governing body of the, uh, um, the Kyoto Protocol, um, that would uh, signal this, this was going to happen. Um, and more work to be done next year. So it keeps that decision making on track, but it was a very difficult and, and fraught um, uh, issue to negotiate uh, in the closing hours of the COP. The second finance article uh, uh, issue was in relation to Article 9.5 of the Paris Agreement, which is about forecasts for climate finance expenditure by developed countries. Um, there is work underway already um, under the COP uh, to uh, um, discuss the information that is being provided or will be provided with these climate finance forecasts, but it was uh, quite explicitly not agreed um, uh, as part of the Paris outcome that there would be work done on the modalities for um, such forward reporting. Um, 
but uh, this was a, um, a hugely contentious issue um, with uh, an attempt led by the African group of nations to try and, and introduce a new um, terms of reference, if you like, for work being done on uh, Article 9.5 so that it would uh, address modalities. So once again, um, some uh, small advances were made. Um, and the compromise outcome saw um, the proponents uh, for this new uh, item succeed in opening uh, a fresh avenue for discussion through the subsidiary bodies, so they get a, a bite at the cherry in uh, the middle of year, the year next year, as well as um, at the COP to have a discussion. Um, and they kept uh, um, another item on the APA agenda where we could talk about whether um, there needed to be a, a, um, a, a discussion on, on modalities, but the proponents failed to get an extended mandate to address modalities um, at this, this point for reporting. Um, a couple of other contentious issues on the final night um, were first of all a question about um, what happened with the informal notes uh, from the co-facilitators of the different items under the Paris Agreement work program. Um, there was a desire on the part of um, many, including Fiji, uh, to see these compiled in some way because that would be a, a one-place demonstration of uh, the progress that had been achieved. There were, however, a number of um, uh, parties who were very reluctant to see such a compilation on the, view, uh, on the basis this would prejudge uh, um, uh, a position on the outcome of the Paris Agreement work program next year. Um, there are a number who see this outcome as a single decision, which means it's, it's sort of, you know, you've got to vote it up, vote it down kind of thing, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity then for um, some negotiating leverage to, to be applied, um, or hostage taking, depending on your perspective. Um, but, uh, and others who do not see the outcome as necessarily being a single decision, but uh, um, say this is not a treaty, these are implementation guidelines um, and need to be uh, addressed in their own individual right on the basis of what makes sense for them. So coming up with um, dealing with compilation was, uh, was a tricky issue, not helped by the wording that was, uh, that was used. Um, and uh, the second, um, I guess, unexpected uh, outcomes uh, was, uh, sorry, just lost my notes here, uh, the status um, of that uh, um, decision on the, the facilitative dialogue 2018, but I did already discuss that. Surprise outcome. On the positive side uh, was agreement to a new work program on agriculture under the subsidiary bodies, and Victoria is going to, to talk about that. Um, and uh, that was very welcome uh, from our perspective. Um, and the last two unexpected items were both issues of priorities for the Pacific Island um, uh, countries. Uh, first of all, loss and damage was not specifically on the decision-making list, but many developing countries uh, want to uh, enhance the profile uh, of loss and damage and to inject it much more fully into the Paris Agreement work program. So that again was, uh, um, was the uh, subject of some intensive discussions over the course of the, the COP. The outcome was agreement to a SUVA dialogue on loss and damage, um, but still uh, keeping uh, the responsibility for loss and damage issues pretty firmly within the Warsaw International Mechanism that was established uh, at uh, Warsaw COP uh, a few years ago. And finally, at the pre-COP, um, Fiji had signalled its desire to put the focus um, on uh, the oceans and climate change uh, nexus. Its initial plans were probably um, overly ambitious um, and, and were not going to be able to fly, but Fiji listened to the feedback uh, and adjusted expectations with the result that this oceans pathway was launched with New Zealand uh, on board. 
So as I said, um, I was chairing the APA and uh, left the New Zealand delegation in Anna's capable hands, so I'm now going to pass to her to talk about New Zealand uh, at the COP. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you, Seamus. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. It's very nice to see you. As, um, as Joe has said, my name is Anna Broadhurst. I was the head of the New Zealand delegation at the COP, um, leading, as was my privilege, a very strong and expert team. Um, I'm going to speak really briefly about um, New Zealand's presence at the COP, particularly our engagement with the Global Climate Action Agenda and our response to the COP-specific focus. Um, so starting off with um, who was there for New Zealand. Um, it was actually a very, very good, strong turnout, considering it was born in the middle of winter and a COP that wasn't expected to, to deliver um, terribly much excitement. So um, we had a New Zealand delegation, which uh, comprised two brand new ministers, Minister Shaw um, from the Green Party as our climate change minister, and um, Minister Alpito William Seo as our Pacific Island People's um, Minister from the Labour Party. And we also had the opposition now our position spokesperson for climate change, Todd Mueller, as part of our delegation as well. So really good cross-party representation. Um, each of our ministers brought advisors with them. Um, we had then had 17 officials from MFAT, MPI and MFE. I realise now I'm not showing you the slide. <laughs> there we go. Um, and also two representatives on behalf of the government of Tokelau, which participates in the New Zealand delegation as, um, as it is entitled to due to its constitutional status. Um, we also had a very active and engaged contingent of New Zealand NGOs, uh, youth and business delegates. Um, so I would acknowledge there are many members of the New Zealand delegation here and it is great to see you all and once again thank you for your work and um, just to let everybody know that um, we have a lot of experts here in the room if your questions get into expert territory we'll be very quick to call on them. Um, so what we were doing at the COP then, uh, we were in the formal negotiations and here's a picture. This is um, Sophie, our lawyer, Seamus, who you'll hear from shortly, and I uh, behind the flag, which is actually a nameplate, um, in one of the formal negotiations. So this is a, a very, very large room um, with all countries sitting with sort of three to six representatives in a similar kind of seating arrangement with a, a microphone we can seek by pushing the button. Um, we look tired because we were working very hard. Um, I'm not sure if this is when we first arrived and have jet lag or when we've finally gone um, almost two weeks with very, very little sleep, but um, being tired is part and parcel of, of being at the COP, that's for sure. Um, so the delegation were, as I said, working very hard on pack schedules um, and working through the long days, and I think Seamus may talk a little more about how that felt. Um, but the delegation experts were active in each of the major negotiations that were going on, advancing New Zealand's interests very, very well, um, which is why we are, we are satisfied with the outcome that, that Joe has described. Um, they were also indirectly influencing these outcomes through a number of informal channels in which New Zealand, again, was very active. These include the Friends of Pre-2020 Action, the Friends of Ambition on Shipping, the High Ambition Coalition, the Cartagena Dialogue for Progressive Action, and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Um, and the latter had a particularly agricultural focus, which Victoria may, may come to. Um, we worked um, also in bilaterals and in um, smaller group meetings for brainstorming with, with like-minded colleagues. So a lot of information exchange went on over the course of the two weeks. Um, we had networking exercises and daily briefings for our stakeholders, so we are very delighted again to see some of our stakeholders in the audience and to have Rachel with us on the panel. Um, it's been excellent to, to get to know these, um, these very enthusiastic New Zealanders and, to, and through them to understand a little bit better about what was going on at the COP outside the negotiations. Um, and it is great that we're going to hear from Rachel shortly. Now, but one of our big focuses at, at the COP, um, particularly in the second week, was supporting our brand new ministers. Um, the ministers engaged in lots of bilateral meetings. They attended a non-stop schedule of events. Um, Minister Shaw made our national statement midway through the second week, and, um, and that generated a really high level of interest in, in our new government and its priorities. Um, and they're very clear messages that the ministers brought to the COP about New Zealand establishing itself as a leader on the global stage on climate change and the pursuit support for the Pacific and both of these messages were, were very very well received 
Um, you know, we found the hit experience of, of sort of people lurking in the corridors or outside our delegation room waiting to say hi to us. Um, as we walked along, people would introduce themselves to our ministers. Um, so for them, um, you know, there was sort of a bit of a cult following around them. And um, I think afterwards, um, they reflected on, on, you know, they had been a, that aspect of it had been a surprise. But overall, they, they felt they had achieved what they wanted to from the COP and their participation had been very worthwhile. Um, um, next thing I'm going to talk about is, is not quite Rachel, sorry Seamus, I've misunderstood the order of the slides. Um, I'm going to talk about the Pacific aspects of, of the COP a little bit. Um, you would have seen through, through some of Joe's pictures that the Pacific theme was, was very important. Um, and I want to say that uh, Fiji tried very hard to create some um, Pacific cultural norms in, in this multilateral negotiation. As Joe mentioned, we were meeting in the middle of Europe, in the middle of winter, um, it's, it couldn't be further from, um, from Nandi, <laughs> where we'd had the beautiful pre-COP only weeks before. Uh, but they did, they did do the best. So Joe showed the photo of, of the, the Drua. Um, there were also a lot of uh, Fijian language presence on, on signage around the buildings. And a lot of, um, you know, we, we spoke of Buddha Vinaka as we acknowledged people. And that was, um, you know, that was part of, of creating the, the Fijian spirit. Um, the Fijian team wore Sulus, which is their national costume. And so they're very easy to, to find in the out. Um, and there's a sort of infusion of, of Bullish spirit in, in the discussions, which was manifested in, in the inclusive and, um, sorry, the warm and welcoming sort of cheering and arrangements of the meetings. And then the big focus, as Joe has mentioned, on the concept of Talanoa, which was um, about inclusiveness and participation and in the decision making that went on in, at, at this COP, um, as well as the daily drumming displays and, and kava ceremonies. So um, we. You know, we went with a Pacific. We went with a specific objective of um, reassuring Pacific Islanders of our interests and in, in their interests and, and our preparedness. As the minister had said, to stand with the Pacific um, in the global response to climate change, um, and that was a, a you know a big a big focus of our action at the COP. So the minister's message was a, um, was a clear one that they delivered in person on the ground very, very early in their meeting, having actually traveled with a number of Pacific meeting ministers from a audience with the Pope at the Vatican um, a, a few days beforehand. So the, minister, the Pacific ministers all arrived in Bonn, more or less together, having, having got to know each other um, in another European city. But they, um, so we had some very good relationships to start with. Nonetheless, we convened a number of Pacific leaders in our delegation room very early in the COP, once again to, to reinforce our support, our interest in their perspectives um, and priorities for the meeting and to, sort of to talk about how we could work together. And that really got our second week off to a very positive start with those relationships. And um, you know, I think also the high, the good communication channels that we established through that that very high level sort of commitment to standing with the Pacific, it served all of our negotiators very well in, in the negotiation rooms after that. Um, you know, Fiji, as Joe said, Fiji came to this COP looking to get good outcomes for, some Pacific, for the Pacific Islanders, and um, New Zealand very firmly supported those. And we are aware that these included risk and resilience insurance, climate change and health, climate change and human rights, UN policy coherence, and long-term climate change strategies out to 2050. Um, these were the thematic themes of the high-level event, which Fiji as president can um, choose, which the leaders will talk about, and the, the events that they will have the opportunities to attend through the week. And so Fiji chose these themes as, as of key interest to, um, to Pacific Islands and other SIDS. And um, so New Zealand was you know, present in those meetings. Um, another aspect of um, this theme, though, was that the negotiation, there were points of negotiation that were of key interest to the Pacific as well. And Joe has, has pointed these out, adaptation, finance, and, and loss and damage. So in New Zealand's approach to these issues um, was to try to take a constructive bridge building role. And we went strident on behalf of donor interests um, but we were also trying to encourage the Pacific Islanders to, uh, countries to, to recognise the value of the incremental progress that could be made, that was possible to make in a, in a UNFCCC meeting like this. And um, you know, the Super Work Program on Loss and Damage is a really good example of that progress. We get some profile, but we um, you know, continue to build on what we have established through that Warsaw International Mechanism. So um, we feel we've been quite, actually quite 
successful in those ways of, of helping the Pacific and helping um, helping them to really get what they can out of this UNFCCC meeting. And um, finally, I think the, the other aspect is that some of the negotiations did get tricky. There were things that was hard for Fiji to navigate its way through. Um, and we, you know, we and our ministers made ourselves available on call to support them um, in small meetings and, and other ways to help bring that forward, um, bring forward some answers and on those issues. And again, I think we were able to play a constructive part in that way. Now, I'm going to stop now and um, hand over to Rachel, um, and then I'll come back on some of the global climate action agenda issues. Hello. Hello. Um, my name's Rachel Cooper. I was part of the Aotearoa Youth Leadership Institute youth delegation to COP. There were a group of 10 of us and we all came from very different backgrounds and we worked on very different things at COP. And yeah, there was also, I want to acknowledge quickly, uh, Te Arafatu, another great delegation from New Zealand, or actually from all over the Pacific, representing indigenous peoples. They worked on great stuff at COP and yeah, a great bunch of people. So at COP, there were a lot of young New Zealanders, which was really great to see. There was a lot of action and enthusiasm and yeah, it was a really great atmosphere. So I'll quickly describe the role of stakeholders at COP and what it means to be an observer. So observers generally, the goal is to really push for stronger policies and to push for more action and to really hold the government to account. And that's, yeah, it's a great learning opportunity for us also. We're exposed to a lot of different things and get to meet a lot of people. So yeah, there's a lot of great opportunities that come from that. And we also follow the negotiations that really interest us. For me, I followed the agriculture negotiations, but a lot of people could follow a lot of things and also have a bit of input, which is really great. Um, some of the challenges that we faced at COP as stakeholders and observers is what I found being acknowledged and heard in the, I can't speak for other people, but in the agriculture negotiations, there were five meetings of the parties and stakeholders were allowed to enter the first and the last and not the in-between ones. And in the first one, all the discussions happened and then it got to civil society's turn and they ran out of time. So civil society couldn't have any input <laughs> until the last one where everyone spoke and it got to the end, everything was decided. So civil society again didn't really get to have an input. So felt kind of tokenistic me being there in a way, but we got to have inputs in other ways, which was really good. So I'll start to describe that in that there's lots of working groups at COP. So there's the Climate Action Network, working groups and there's also youth groups, um, agriculture groups, women's groups, indigenous groups where you can have, we did a lot of writing policy documents, writing recommendations, writing press releases, doing press conferences. So that was a really good way to have an input and people could read that and come to our events and yeah, that, yeah was a much better way than being yeah, excluded from the negotiations themselves, although not all of them we were excluded from. Um, and I will also quickly talk about the COP itself. This COP was split up into two different zones. So there was a buller zone and a bond zone. And the buller zone was where the negotiations went on, and the bond zone was where there was a lot of action, a lot of stalls, a lot of yeah, yeah, that's where a lot of other actions went on. So the, the zones this COP were very separated. Spatially, there were quite a few kilometres in between. You had to catch buses or cars or, yeah, it was very separate. And that made it quite challenging for, I know, for negotiators to get to the bond zone, but also for us to get around because we wanted to go to both things. And... Yeah, there were some really great things that went on in the bond zone. There were 
a lot of actions such as this year there was an American clean coal um, event which didn't really go down that well. There were people in the room, probably a hundred people, stood up, started chanting and left and then outside there were about 200 other people protesting at the door. So there was a lot of action that went on at that zone which is very different to the Buller zone itself where it was mostly negotiations. And then, yeah, I think the bond zone was a place where there was a lot of people power and yeah, it showed a lot of collective power and that's a place where stakeholders could really get involved in the actions and yeah, in the events that were going on. Yeah, that's all I really hope to say. Thank you, Rachel. That was really very um, interesting. To, I think I'd reinforce those messages about the very different experiences you can have in the bond zone and in the buller zone. Um, the bond zone, as she has said, is where Fiji was in charge. It's where the um, negotiations were taking place. Um, the German uh, hosts of um, the COP built an enormous tent, <laughs> huge tents, but um, the Buller Zone is very, very much a, um, a enormous but down the river kind of experience um, for a negotiator, mostly stuck in the Buller Zone. Um, this is the photo I had meant to show you when I was talking about the Pacific. Um, this is a picture of some of the Pacific leaders inside the New Zealand delegation room at the um, with Minister Shaw and Minister Sio, um, they came, we had a morning tea after, after our round table and um, this is the photo we took at the end of that event. Um, but I'm now going to talk about, is this, man? this is my slide? Yours, okay, I'll go back. Um, I'm now briefly then going to talk about um, some of the experience that New Zealand had in, um, on the global climate action agenda. So that's the, basically the overarching framework for the events that take place in that bond zone. Um, so the, the Global Climate Action Agenda was agreed in Marrakesh, um, but it was the culmination of a, a process that started in Lima and um, developed further in Paris of bringing together um, state and non-state actors to make um, announcements and collaborate together on the action to reduce emissions and increase resilience. Um, this is a parallel space to the negotiations, but it's very important for its demonstration effect of um, action is happening. Action is happening now, and um, action doesn't really depend on negotiators entirely. <clears throat> and so that's a quite an important and, and very powerful message, as Joe said, and, um, over the course of this year in light of the US position. There was a lot of action um, underway under the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action. Um, so as, as Rachel has described, that's where the side events were. There were launch ceremonies, there were declarations, there were celebrities. It really was the place to be if you weren't a negotiator. Um, so New Zealand, though, did have um, some presence there. We had two side events on the agricultural side around climate data and precision agricultural technology, which Victoria and Craig will speak about. Um, we also were part of a side event to promote fossil fuel subsidy reform. And we didn't co-sponsor that this year, but we attended and the Minister CEO spoke. And we also hosted a Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform meeting. And we joined a, um, a couple of new initiatives that were launched at this COP. Um, one of these is the Powering Past Coal Alliance. So this is a 20 country alliance led by Canada and the United Kingdom. Um, together we have pledged to phase out unab unabated coal power, which um, includes carbon capture and storage. Um, sorry, abatement includes carbon capture and storage. Um, we will not put public finance into unabated coal power and we will collaborate together to build a coalition of 50 entities, including the private sector and local governments um, by COP24 to work on these goals. Um, I would note the alliance also got a plug at this week's Climate Finance Summit in Paris. Um, the next thing we joined was the High Ambition Coalition on the Talanoa Dialogue Communique. Um, New Zealand has been very active in the High Ambition Coalition over the last year. Um, its purpose is political outreach to support ambitious outcomes from the negotiations. Um, on this issue of the Talanoa Dialogue, there was a feeling that some countries wanted to constrain participation in the dialogue to exclude civil society. 
and um, the High Ambition Coalition felt that that would be detrimental to an ambitious outcome, and so we issued a joint communique supporting Fiji's original proposal, which was to for an inclusive, participatory and transparent process in which civil society would participate fully. And that communique was issued on the last day of the COP. And we also joined the Oceans Pathway Platform, as Joe mentioned. So in, under this banner, a number of countries have joined together to actively advocate for the incorporation of, of oceans-related issues into the UNFCCC technical process and to provide some leadership for robust ocean commitments within the context of nationally determined contributions. Um, and there are also there will be promotion of international and domestic climate ocean policies and actions. And this is one of Fiji's, Fiji's key national interests given the vast, um, I suppose a very small island as part of a, a continent that's mostly water. Um, this is one of its priorities and for its Pacific neighbours too. So New Zealand was pleased to join that. And um, the final thing I'll mention is that the high level assembly of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition had uh, issued a joint communique, which New Zealand also signed up to. Um, this year, the CCAC, as it's known, called for action on short-lived climate pollutants from agriculture and from waste. Um, this followed on from a challenge New Zealand issued last year to have the CCAC do more on agriculture. And um, we have MPI experts in the room able to talk more about that if anyone is interested. Indeed, now I'm going to hand over to Victoria. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you um, for your attention and time this morning while I talk about the um, unexpected agriculture outcome. Perfect, thanks Seamus. Okay, so um, I'm very new to this process. This was only my second COP um, and I'm very privileged to have been part of the delegation. Um, and agriculture has tended to play an underwhelming role within the UNFCCC climate ne negotiations. And Rachel makes it sound so interesting, so I'm going to be really excited <laughs> to, um, to tell you what we did. Um, the historic outcome for agriculture has been slightly subdued um, because it sits a little bit outside of the Paris work program. But um, countries have been very excited to make progress. We've been deliberating and negotiating since about 2011. I think the last, Paul Melville was probably part of the last um, delegation where there was some action taken for workshops and um, technical papers. But countries have tended to find it very difficult to find a common ground, um, sort of this difficulty between the climate change and the food security nexus, which has led to a lot of differentiation between the, the roles and expectations of developed and developing countries. Um, so um, in, within that context, I think the Paris Agreement has allowed countries to take responsibility from that bottom-up approach um, to determine their own national contributions to the Paris goal, and I think this has made them realize that actually, in order to be able to fulfill their goal, they have to have the technologies, they have to have the expertise, they have to have um, climate finance available to enable them to do that. So I think that realization has helped them to um, achieve this historic outcome. But I also think that um, the scale of the problem for agriculture is quite significant and possibly a little bit underappreciated within the whole UNFCCC process. I think um, if you take 100, I think there's 1.5 billion smallholder farmers um, who see agriculture as being their source of food rather than um, production um, for uh, global consumption. So I think um, it's about feeding their families, it's about giving themselves heat, um, clothing, it's about sending their children to school really. So when the, you take that scale of the problem um, and put it in a global context, it's very difficult to find um, mitigation solutions and deliver those mitigation solutions at that significant scale. So I think if you take all of this into context, it's no wonder it's taken a long time for us to reach an agreement within the agriculture negotiations, but we did it. And what did we come out with? We came out with the Coronivia Joint Work Program on agriculture. And um, Coronivia is a place in Fiji. It's an agriculture research station. Um, it's been named to recognize the Fiji COP presidency, and it will always be known as a, a historic outcome that was done under the Fiji COP presidency. So 
There are theories about what made the difference this time. Um, why now, apart from the fact that I think countries are um, ready to start delivering on their um, Paris Agreement goals. There was a number of different changes around the negotiating table. The number of women participating this time was quite significant. And I think, you know, being a woman myself, and I'm going to blow our own trumpet for a little bit, um, we'd like to get the job done. We are moving away from playing the games. We're there to do a job, and we want to get it done. Um, after 24 hours of face-to-face -face negotiations, I think we just got to the point where we needed to get some resolution. And with 24 of us huddled around a table in the Japanese delegation room with 15 minutes till the hammer down, it was very exciting and it was a case of, you know, actually just get rid of that word, sign it, move on, and let's just, you know, go along with this. So, um, but I think getting to that point was about tr building trust and understanding, and we've done a lot of that over the last 12 months um, with the World Bank and the FAO and other organizations, sort of really giving us time and dedication to be able to, um, in, a, in a very um, uh, open and sort of Chatham House rules type approach, we've been able to discuss what our differences are and what, um, what's really stopping us from making progress. So we've had um, quite a significant amount of um, opportunity over the last 12 months to discuss those. Um, so the Corona View Joint Work Program is um, it's a program that's focused on implementation. And I think this is what developing countries were really wanting. They want to see action on the ground. They want to see a focus on being able to get technologies, getting practices, getting information on farm to enable change to take place. And um, this has come about by a joint work program between SUBSTA, which is the science and technology body under uh, the UNFCCC, and the implementation body, which is SBI. Um, and COP has... Um, basically asked us both to work together moving forward. So um, what does it mean for New Zealand? Um, because ultimately that's sort of a big question for us as government. What does this mean for New Zealand? So we have an opportunity now to consolidate um, and condense all of our um, intellectual knowledge, our technologies, our technological know-how, um, and all our scientific expertise to make submissions by the 31st of March. Now, what do submissions mean? Well, basically, all 192 parties, which have um, members of the convention, have an opportunity to write um, sort of document. I don't know how to describe them, but documents which may include that scientific expertise or knowledge that other parties can then access and make use of. But then we also have an opportunity to develop a work program where we may have uh, workshops and technical papers and. Um, external experts come in to talk to people about what is listed in those documents. So for New Zealand, it's an opportunity for us to um, increase the global awareness of what we do. And we do agriculture really well. So this is a good opportunity for us to, to get that knowledge and know-how out there. So I'm going to be working with um, our science community over the next couple of months in order to get that um, sort of information there in a very succinct manner. But then we also have the opportunity to leverage off the Global Research Alliance, which has got 49 member countries. And we will be um, utilizing our network to enable the messaging that we want to see delivered in, that, uh, in those submissions, making sure that they come through in those 49 member countries as well. Um, and then um, the options for consideration for New Zealand, which were important, are livestock management, um, soil carbon and fertility, how to manage nutrients within the system, but also looking at that social economic um, sort of dimension to um, agriculture and what is needed on the ground to make a change. So um, all of the stuff that we do within the UNFCCC process and the submissions that we're going to be making all fit really nicely within our international work program. And, um, we've already mentioned the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which is quite a significant sort of arm of our international work program. But we've used COP this time as well to, um, to really push a theme called um, that's precision technology for agriculture development. And it's a theme that New Zealand is very passionate about, and we're very good at it, and we're world leaders around the precision technology space. So we took the opportunity, I'm going to move the slide. 
Um, we took the opportunity to host a half-day event. Um, it was supported by Fiji and the World Bank, and um, we brought in experts from all over the world to talk about um, precision technology, one of whom is Craig McKenzie, who's, I'm just going to segue in by introducing Craig. Um, Craig and his wife Roz are actually farmers. They have an, um, a dairy and cropping farm down in the South Island. And um, they own a small precision technology firm called AgriOptics. But they've um, also won International Farmer of the Year in 2016 for their precision technology implementation on farm. So, Craig. Thank you. Um, I'm not as well prepared today for slides, so you're just going to have to have uh, some talk from me. Um, firstly, um, thanks Victoria for the introduction, and I'd also like to thank MPI for supporting me to go up to the COP. It was a real privilege to go there as a farmer and, and be part of that, um, certainly an eye-opening opportunity. Um, when I went, I actually represented Precision Ag Association of New Zealand, which I'm chair of, um, or have been, um, it's just changing now, um, and our farms and also our Precision Ag company. But I guess more importantly, I also representing New Zealand Inc. as well. Um, I had an opportunity to be a, a keynote speaker and uh, sit on a couple of panels, and um, that was very interesting to sit on those and talk about precision agriculture, but also something that's pretty dear to our heart around water and water use efficiency, um, and some of the panels focused on that more than others. Managed rub shoulders with some of the ministers, and it was a great opportunity. It's funny how you sometimes go away from New Zealand and end up with an opportunity to talk to our new ministers in particular and, and um, spend some time with them, um, which is good because we build a relationship where we can actually build on that and, and uh, have good conversations back here in New Zealand. And, and of course all the officials of you that were there, that was, um, that was really good too for me. Um, we we're always learning from these opportunities and, and it's not until we challenge each other that we actually have some good exchanges of ideas and that was one of the things for me that came out of the COP. Um, some of the, the panels that I actually were involved with, with um, so the, the FAO um, was an interesting one and some of the company reps, senior company reps on one of the panels and it was interesting how they actually had a very particular view on how they were going to fix water use and water quality. So scientists often, and there'll be a few of you here so don't get too offended, but um, often have a view on what that solution is. But actually, you need to be engaged with the farmers to be able to understand that. And that gave me an opportunity to have that conversation. So three of them sort of rolled through, we'll charge for water, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I said, well, maybe you just want to wait a little bit and talk about what we actually do do on farm. So the second half of the panel conversation was completely different to the first part because we'd actually had that engagement. And I think that's what the panels allow you to do at the COP. I also had an opportunity to spend uh, a day with the chief scientist from the, the G20 um, at Agritechnica for a day. And, and again, some of them were very educated, know what they're talking about, but actually when it comes to a practical view, sometimes it's slightly different. One of them in particular from the UK said, we know exactly, how, and we broke into some panel, uh, some sessions, and he said, I know exactly how to fix the, the what farmers are doing and change the carbon issue and, uh, and the, the emissions, and that we just put a carbon tax in, so that'll just solve it. I said, really? So I said, actually, if you think about that for a minute, so if you're from the UK, you have the highest fuel price in the world, you put the f fuel price up by 10 or 20 cents a litre today, everybody hurts, and tomorrow it's not very good but actually that won't change anybody driving down your motorways at 140 kilometres an hour, will it? And he said, hey, no, actually, you're right. So, so I was a little bit, um, <laughs> uh, stirred them up a little bit, gave them something to think about before they headed off back to uh, Berlin, I think. I'm also, I think it's very important that these things actually have some food producers and like, like the, the young New Zealanders that were there as well, I think that's really important because we've actually got some diversity. If we don't have food producers in amongst that, then we actually don't have an opportunity to actually help shape it. I'm also a Global Farmer Network board member and the network is um, supporting developing countries as well as developed, but actually we as a, as a board actually have a very strong view on how we can help those developing countries improve and it was interesting the same theme came through at the COP of 
what does it do with our current farming techniques and how can we help them improve that? And I, so I think there was, a, for me, a good alignment for what we've actually been doing in the network. And I think it also, um, we have similar um, connections and I made a connection with the World Bank, which is good because I think the World Bank have the same uh, view on some of those sustainability issues in some of those countries as what the Global Farmer Network does. Uh, it was funny, I put up a, a slide actually um, just before that there and, and um, one, I put up the slide of an Africa with a tool measuring soil fertility and one of the guys came up to me afterwards and said, so where did you get that picture? And I said, well I actually got it off the internet. He said, well that's really interesting because that's actually our product. I went, oh shit, <laughs> I wasn't sure that was going to be good or bad. But actually he was really encouraged that actually we were thinking about that in the developing world as well as the developed world. And, and they've targeted the developed world initially, but developing world I should say initially, but they're very keen to head into the developed world. So there's some real opportunities for us in New Zealand to actually bring some of that tech back here. So the relationships that I've been able to make out of it were really key. Um, and that was just a precision ag technology on a very basic level and there's lots that we do differently here. But the meeting for me confirmed how um, PA can help uh, both in New Zealand but also globally. Uh, we have an opportunity in some of the developing countries that were talked about before how you can not only feed those people but you can probably du double the uh, double their production. But it's actually not the technology that's going to do it, it's how do we transfer the thought processes that we do, and that we have, and how can we do that. And there were some good conversations that came out of that while I was there. One thing that really struck me, and we went to a lot of the side events, and um, a lot of the people talked about what the problems were. And yes, there is lots of problems and sea level and, and the Pacific is an issue. But actually for a lot of those, there was a lack of conversations around the solutions. So I think we've got a long way to go to talk about what the solutions are and what can make a difference. And there's certainly lots happening here and globally that we could probably use. The other thing that was interesting for me was people actually looked at it and thought about, and, and the science, chief scientists were a little bit in this space where they were looking for the latest technology that was going to solve the issues. But actually the fastest way to solve a lot of the issues and actually have climate change mitigation is to actually adopt all of the technology that we've got currently available today. We don't need to wait for lots of new technology to come, we've actually got lots at our fingertips today. But that's a thought process that needs to change and that's not just in the developing countries. Um, and that will, um, today's tech will have a big impact in, and if we use it correctly on the reduction of the effects of climate change, um, emissions intensity, environmental pressure, and also increase financial sustainability, which is uh, absolutely paramount in the, the developing countries. It gave me a much greater network, I guess, than, than what we have. We, we travel a bit globally anyway, but it's always nice to go to something different, and this was completely different. But it really reinforced for me that New Zealand is on the right track uh, where we're heading with the technology that we're doing, and we've got some great opportunities here for mitigation. Um, and, but more importantly, we actually need to use the expertise that's here in New Zealand collectively between um, government and researchers and scientists and, and farmers. And, um, and I think we should stop talking about farmers as being farmers. We're actually food producers. And I think once we talk about food production, then I think it changes the attitude dramatically. So I'll, I'll leave it there and hand over to Seamus. Good morning everyone. Um, I'm going to speak very, very briefly because I'm mindful that you'll want to uh, ask some questions. Apologise as well, our slides have jumped around a bit. Um, I assure you we're better at negotiating than we are at PowerPoint. All right, so my, um, I, I was fortunate enough to join the team of negotiators at COP23. This is my first major multilateral meeting. Um, it was a real privilege to represent New Zealand at COP um, and sit behind the, uh, the nameplate, the flag. Um, in some ways, COP is a really unreal kind of experience. Um, it is like nothing else. More than once, I found myself in a negotiating room uh, until close to or after midnight, working through an issue or trying to wrangle some sense out of a sentence. Um, as has been mentioned, this COP was a little bit different uh, with Fiji presiding and Germany hosting. This led to the one conference, two zones approach. Uh, so the formal negotiations, as you see, took place in the Billa zone, which encompassed the World Conference Centre Bonn, the UN campus and country delegation offices. So think of this like a busy airport, but with people rushing to meeting rooms instead of departure gates. 
the Global Climate Action Agenda that Anne has talked about, which um, that took place in the Bond Zone, uh, some 1.5 k's down the banks of the Rhine River. Uh, so the Bond Zone, on the other hand, is more like a shopping mall on Boxing Day, um, but instead of stores and sales, you've got an immeasurable array of exhibits, pavilions, stalls, where countries, businesses, NGOs, uh, sort of demonstrating their ideas and commitments to climate action. Unfortunately, the physical distance between the zones was a challenge for everyone, really, negotiators and civil society, especially with uh, the distance and the winter weather sort of setting in. To counter this, a range of transport options were available, electric shuttles, buses, and free-to-hire bicycles. Uh, if you follow Minister Shaw on Twitter, you'll know that he took to the bikes more than once. Um, although most of the negotiators were tied up in the Buller Zone, New Zealand was really actively engaged in both zones, as has been discussed already. We convened two side events, joined a range of initiatives as well that Anna ran through. Ministers CO and Shaw kept really busy schedules across the two zones, representing New Zealand at a range of side events and holding bilateral meetings with counterparts. With the uh, announcement by President Trump that the US would withdraw from the Paris Agreement, the nature of the US presence at COP23 was something of an unknown. Um, the torch, so to speak, was picked up by this group here. Uh, the America's Pledge group of states, cities and businesses, including California and Washington. So this grouping, which is led by former New York uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who's speaking here, and the Governor of California, Jerry Brown, represents over half the US population and a $10.1 trillion share of the US economy. So that's actually the bulk of the US um, economy represented by this group. So in this photo, uh, Michael Bloomberg, he's launching the America's Pledge Report, um, which documents the scale and scope of non-federal US climate action. Effectively, their goal is to uh, indicate to the world that they are still in. Um, that's me for now. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Joe. Thanks, Seamus. Um, and just to, to finish, before we move to uh, q and I um, wanted to talk about the year ahead. Um, and uh, I think you've got a sense of the scale and the size and the complexity of uh, what COP23 was all about from the, the various people who um, have talked today. But 2018 is going to be an extremely big year for climate change internationally. First um, and foremost, uh, it's the deadline for completing the Paris Agreement uh, work program by COP24 in Katowice, Poland. There is um, uh, clearly a massive amount of work to be done, uh, with outputs this year still reflecting multiple options. And those need to be, uh, you know, uh, a convergence and compromise needs to be found. Uh, and at some point, pretty early in 2018, we will need to get to uh, a negotiating text, and more than one iteration is going to likely be needed uh, for that. Um, it's a question, it's an open question as to who produces that text um, and when uh, uh, that happens. But there'll be uh, a lot of focus and a lot of interest on that from the moment uh, we start convening with each other next year. It's difficult, I think, in um, the, the COP, in the um, UNFCCC, to move beyond uh, a kind of treaty negotiation mindset. Most of the negotiators spent years working um, up to the, the Paris Agreement itself, which is, of course, um, a treaty. But what we need to do now is uh, negotiate and agree technical guidelines, and that process should be difficult. Uh, well, it will be difficult, but it should be different. Um, however, uh, the technical and the political are simply not able to be separated. So it is going to be tricky next year, and I think the overriding question is going to be how we can design guidelines that, um, uh, on the one hand, don't see um, developed countries have the opportunity or the, the possibility of what is described as backsliding from the robust way in which they report and, and uh, account uh, for their uh, emissions and actions, and at the same time, don't force developing countries to jump beyond where their reporting, monitoring, and policy-making capacities can immediately take them. And they have um, some considerable anxiety about being suddenly required to do things their systems 
uh, are simply not geared up to, to achieve. Um, for some, that leads to a position that we must have two parallel systems. Uh, for others, um, and uh, New Zealand uh, um, is certainly amongst them, we believe uh, the outcome should be a single rule set with built-in flexibility to accommodate those more limited capacities um, on the part of, of many, um, if not most, developing countries, but allow for improvement over time and indeed support uh, improvement uh, being developed over time. So um, to manage this process in the year ahead and uh, uh, allow the thinking to evolve, it's going to need time. Um, the uh, the time-honoured tradition of having um, a take-it-or-leave-it text drop from the sky at the 11th hour um, is uh, not really going to be ideal uh, for technical guidance. Um, and a question will be how do we make the time and how do we make best use of the time that is there. We have a regular session in May and a COP um, firmly scheduled. There is the possibility of an extra formal negotiating session being, being held to work specifically on all issues under the Paris Agreement work program, but that was not confirmed um, at, at the COP this year. Views vary as to whether holding an additional meeting um, is actually genuinely helpful um, or just, uh, um, you know, can see the wheels spinning, if you like, on the, on the negotiations uh, for a bit longer. Um, the question, I think, is, is better addressed if we think about um, what iterations of text might be required, um, because there is a bit of a process of, of um, texts kind of ballooning out, being stripped back, ballooning out again until finally um, being wrestled into some reasonable shape by the end. Um, in addition to those formal sessions and the possible additional one, there will of course be a bunch of other informal meetings. Um, and last year, for example, um, China, the EU and Canada um, jointly convened a ministerial meeting on climate action held in Montreal. And they've signalled they want to continue um, this ministerial meeting process this year to try and get that, that political engagement uh, on some of the issues that need to be resolved. Um, Seamus referred to uh, Governor Jerry Brown of California, who is convening a major um, summit uh, at sub-national uh, government level and, and business level um, in, I think it's April or May the, this next year. Um, uh, and that will, uh, I think, be significant. Then the Talanoa Dialogue is not just a few hours at, at the COP in, in Poland. Uh, it's going to be a process over the course of the year um, that will allow us to assess our collective progress towards uh, the Paris Agreement's long-term temperature goals. And one of the key things that will inform that is the release of an IPCC special report on scenarios for keeping global temperature in increase to 1.5 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels, and that is due out in September this year. Now, I'm not going to touch on it in the interest of time, but it'll be a big year um, on climate change at home as well, as the government works to progress um, its intended uh, introduction of zero carbon legislation and the establishment of an independent climate commission. Uh, so there'll be a lot, lot of work going on. Finally, though, just to conclude, I want to appreciate very much and, and uh, uh, express my, um, my thanks for the dedication of the New Zealand delegation who worked really hard and tirelessly over more than two weeks um, uh, for uh, the COP itself. The two ministers uh, we had there, Minister Shaw, Minister Seo, had great impact um, and it, it really was um, an opportunity to um, establish and demonstrate uh, at COP23 the expressed intention for New Zealand to um, be a global leader on climate change, uh, and not only um, uh, through our actions at home and our engagement with the Pacific, but also, of course, in the international negotiations themselves. 
There was an enormous effort that went in um, and uh, do uh, want to thank um, Victoria, um, the support Monique Page um, provided through MFAT and the participants, Craig and others, in the uh, uh, very big precision agriculture uh, event we hosted. Um, and uh, to other New Zealanders in Bonn who, whose active and effective engagement, I think Rachel pointed out the, the very um, different ways uh, that the NGO community gets cut through um, and it, it is extremely effective in the negotiations even if you're not um, able to speak for more than a minute and a half um, at the end of uh, some of the, the formal sessions. Um, so uh, I think that uh, my final comment would be that despite the changed basis for US involvement in the, the climate change negotiations through the UNFCCC, it is largely business as usual in the negotiations themselves. Um, the transition is demonstrably ir irreversible to a low carbon uh, global economy. I think the benefits are being increasingly recognised uh, and uh, the vast majority of the world is committed to taking action and that was very much uh, on show in Bonn and will be again next year. So with that I'm going to conclude um, and leave some time uh, for questions uh, which I will convene um, or, or rather uh, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, control. Um, did receive a couple of questions in writing beforehand, so um, I'll kick things off by responding to those. So one was, um, out of interest, was New Zealand represented at Macron's climate summit in Paris last week, and if so, by whom? Um, the uh, Prime Minister and Minister Shaw would have loved to have been um, in Paris for the, the climate summit. Um, unfortunately, uh, they were um, both very much tied up here. Uh, with progressing the 100-day plan um, and were unable to be there. So New Zealand was represented by our ambassador to France, uh, Jane Coombs. The second question, um, given the global carbon budget to stay below two degrees uh, implies not extracting around four-fifths of known fossil fuel reserves and understanding the challenge of meeting New Zealand's NDC target will be greater if more natural gas is, gas is combusted, even as a transition fuel. Here's the question. Should the existing permits for gas exploration under the block offer 2014 be rescinded? Now, it was a very long question to which I have a very short answer. This is outside my mandate. Um, it's very much um, a question that falls within the purview uh, of the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment and um, that ministry's minister. Uh, so I will just have to park it and leave it there. And finally, and those two questions incidentally came from Ralph Sims. Um, and finally, Liam Rutherford um, wrote in to ask, what progress has been made towards a just transition for workers affected by climate change and what has New Zealand's role been in progressing this issue? So um, I guess uh, um, two things there, and um, certainly the government recognises that a just transition is a priority as a part of our, our broader economic transformation to a net zero emissions economy. In the international negotiations, this question of the just transition um, is covered by the forum on the uh, implementation or the impacts of response measures um, and New Zealand uh, is an active participant uh, in that, uh, that forum. <clears throat> We're interested in meaningful discussion amongst countries on that issue of a just transition and uh, we definitely want the topic to uh, continue to be addressed through the response measures forum. At home, um, the question is being addressed uh, uh, currently in two ways. First, through uh, the, the so-called transition hub that is housed um, and is an interdepartmental uh, uh, grouping housed in the Ministry for the Environment. And it's looking um, at, at how we make the long-term transition to a low carbon future. And secondly, the Productivity Commission is looking at how New Zealand can maximise the opportunities and minimise the risks uh, associated with that, that transition. Um, and just transition is uh, um, a question 
you know, how you make uh, this equitable for, for our workers. Um, that uh, forms the basis of, of part of the work of both of those things. So those were the written in questions. We have time now uh, for questions from the floor. I think there are roving mics. Seamus is going to be in charge of those. So starting here. And do please say um, who you are. Martin de Jong from Caritas, um, Catholic Social Justice Agency. Just wondered to what extent, if any, is New Zealand going to be involved in discussions on loss and damage over the next year, including any submissions to the um, Executive Committee's five-year plan? Yeah. Um, New Zealand will be participating in, in discussions on, on loss and damage. Um, you um, were standing, or Seamus, standing next to you, um, was dealing uh, with uh, that question at the COP, so he can answer in a little bit more detail. But we are active participants in uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism um, on loss and damage and will be part of the Suva Dialogue. Seamus, do you want to add anything more? I think that, uh, that pretty much covers it. Um, yeah, we'll continue to be active, continue to feed into uh, the five-year rolling work plan. Um, obviously, loss and damage is a Pacific priority, so it's important certainly for our Pacific Island nations, which means it's important for us. Um, if you want a little more detail, come find me after. We'll see what other um, questions people have. Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a great presentation, Bull of Anaka. <laughs> um, my name's Lindsay Wood. I run a company called Resilience Limited, which focuses on helping organizations actually implement processes and actions at the coalface in response particularly to climate change. So I was interested in Craig's comment about having um, an actual farmer involved because I presented at the Bon EU conference on cities and climates and they were saying, wow, it's wonderful to have a practitioner here asking those questions. So heads up to you. I, I have got a couple of questions. I'll start with one and then you can say whether I'm allowed another one. Um, I'm fascinated by Project Drawdown, the, um, the overall project for bringing down carbon dioxide levels by Paul Hawken. They had a session at Bonn. I'm interested to know if anybody attended. And in particular, if possible, I'd be interested to know if Craig has a comment on the application of silvopasture in New Zealand, which they rank as the ninth most effective strategy. That's integrating tree growth with, with grazing. Um, so that's my first question, and I'll have another one if I may. Anna? Um, so I'm yeah, a little bit familiar with that. I, I guess um, that will fit in some situations, but often not in, in many. Um, it's a little bit operating, I guess, in the vineyards currently as well. So it is, it is happening, um, but some of that will be driven by the price of land and what's actually economic to do that, which is often the driver. So there'll be certain areas that it'll work, but majority um, of some of the country probably not. Yeah, I'm not familiar whether it is. It probably is through the universities, I would imagine. Um, New Zealand does fund um, quite a substantial amount of money in Central America into a silvopasture project through the Global Research Alliance. Um, we've done that over the last three years. I think the results from that project will be coming out in the next 12 months. So whilst it might not necessarily be something that we do here, we are very supportive of the concept where it is appropriate to be applied. And, and I'm not sure if we had anyone uh, present at the um, Project Drawdown side event. There were uh, hundreds and hundreds of side events. So, um, and uh, we looked to ensure we had somebody there wherever it was possible, but um, I'm not sure we, we did manage to have someone there. Um, is there a clamour of other questions, or shall we take your second one? One more at the back, so um, if there's time, we'll come back to you. Thanks. 
Thank you. My name is Robin Halliday from the United Nations Association. We, of course, are very involved with the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 targets of which climate change is one of them. And one of the conclusions that we have come to is that they must be put into cluster groups as such. So I'm very pleased that agriculture was, con was included with climate change. So is oceans, as you mentioned. But, you know, the use of land, transport, and so forth are all there. To what extent were you linking climate change, or did, did you make reference to climate change, in relationship to our commitment to the um, Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? The uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is part of the broader UN family, of course, um, and uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, are very much um, uh, understood and uh, alignment and linkage is uh, uh, identified as a, a, a priority. So um, while the, the negotiations themselves work through the things that are on their you know, agenda to work through, um, there is that overlay and understanding of the need to ensure the, the two are, are well aligned. Um, and I think that's uh, um, an issue where we're certainly looking at domestically here as well um, as to um, how better uh, we might be able to uh, align the work on, on climate change and, and the SDGs delivery of them. And take your second question now. Thank you, that's a privilege. Um, right at the beginning, Joe, you, one of your first comments was, we've got a long way to go on mitigation, when you're talking about the actual outcomes of the, of the Bonn event. Um, and I was talking to a, a very high-level environmentalist in New Zealand just last week who said much the same. In the conferences I was at in, in Europe in September and October, the prevailing comment was um, we should really be focusing on adaptation and resilience. Now, I'm not saying someone's wrong. I'm just wondering, I'd be interested in your take on it and whether that really means that we've just got to max out our efforts on everything. Yeah. Thank you. So, first of all, just to, to clarify that when I said a long way to go on mitigation, what I meant was in terms of the, the implementation guidelines. Um, of course, we've all got a long way to go on mitigation to uh, um, control uh, and contain the temperature increase globally. But the implementation guidelines are around um, what information countries need to put forward uh, to make sure others can understand uh, and be clear about exactly what they're promising. Um, uh, you know, if you've if you're promising to reduce your, your target by, uh, in terms of intensity or, or against a BAU projection, then you need to understand what uh, assumptions underline the, B, the BAU uh, um, projection, for example. And the other area is around accounting, how you account for things like um, the land sector or uh, any involvement in, in carbon markets. So that side of things uh, is uh, where um, the mitigation aspects of um, the guidelines is particularly sensitive and, and um, needs a lot of work. More generally, um, that's that question of mitigation and adaptation and where the, the balance should lie um, has been uh, um, a big issue or was a big issue in the lead up to Paris. Um, and we have, with the Paris Agreement, got, for the first time got the two forms of climate action, if you like, um, on the same footing and, and understanding that both need to, to be dealt with. But I do think um, there is very clearly um, an understanding we're, we're not just all going to give up um, and say, well, okay, let global warming happen um, to whatever um, extent it, it, it's going to happen. We'll just adapt. Um, that's, uh, that's definitely not uh, the, uh, the understanding or expectation. But there is definitely and certainly an understanding that we are already feeling the impacts of climate change. So regardless of, of um, how fast and how far we can deal with the, the mitigation side of the equation, we are having to, all of us, uh, to some extent or another, think about what our adaptation priorities uh, um, should be, what our risk assessments are um, for individual countries and areas and, and how we deal with them. 
possibly got time for one more, and then, yes. Simon Adele from uh, Jacobs Engineering. I wonder if you could expand a little on the, the ocean theme and what the issues are. Are they, are they more environmental or more anthropological coastal processes? It's essentially environmental, but Anna, do you want to uh, take that one up? Sure. Yes, we've got one there. Um, am I on? Yes. Yep. Um, there are, there, they are, the environmental concerns are being managed by a number of different fora, and a big drive for this Oceans Pathway platform was to ensure coherence across the UN policy agenda. Um, there will be new environmental work and research work. Um, some of the environmental focus is, is a, bit, a big of a part of it is around the certification impacts on fisheries and livelihoods, um, but there are also geopolitical impacts, um, the rising sea levels and the impact on um, the rocks and um, outcrops that are used for delimitation of maritime zones and recognition under the law of the sea. And so um, the idea behind the Pathways platform is sort of making sure that there is a, a balanced progress across that spectrum of issues and that it's coherent and um, there's not duplication because there's so much work to be done. Okay. Well, I think we are out of time. Um, so thank you all very much for your attention, for your questions. Um, we were delighted you were able to join us here. Thank you very much indeed uh, to the panelists, uh, for, um, and particularly for Rachel and Craig to give up your time uh, to come in here and, and share your perspectives. So um, thank you. Have um, a good day, um, a good Christmas, a good New Year, and a good summer. Um, and we'll uh, talk to you again next year. Thanks a lot.